Uh, on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, you're all very welcome to today's event with Parfe Onanga and Yanga, who is the uh, special envoy of the UN Secretary General for the Horn of Africa. We're delighted that Parfe has been able to join us today at what is a particularly uh, busy and challenging time for him. Um, this is the seventh in the IIA's Development Matters series, which is sponsored by Irish Aid. Uh, Pafe Onanga and Anyanga has been the special envoy for the Horn of Africa um, since March of last year. Uh, before that, he fulfilled various UN roles, including that of uh, uh, SRSG and head of the UN mission in the Central African Republic. Uh, he was also the coordinator for the UN headquarters response to the Boko Haram crisis. And uh, he was the head of the UN office in Burundi. Um, uh, at an earlier stage, he was the Director of Office for the UN Deputy Secretary General, and uh, other earlier roles included um, a period spent at the Preparatory Commission of the CDPTO, and prior to that he was a diplomat in Gabon's mission to the UN in New York. Um, the Special Envoy will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we will have uh, the usual question and answer session. You can join uh, using the Q&A function uh, on Zoom, which you will see on your screen. Please feel free to send in questions uh, throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them, or to as many as possible of them, uh, during the Q&A session. You can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Um, we're also live streaming today's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in via YouTube. I now invite Sinead Walsh, who is the Deputy Director General of Irish Aid and the Horn of Africa Director, to offer some words of introduction. Sinead is recently back from a highly successful period as the EU's ambassador to South Sudan, and we're delighted to see her back in Dublin. And uh, Sinead, over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, David, and, and, and delighted to, to see you uh, and, and also to see uh, Special Envoy uh, Parfait. Um, in, in preparation for today, I was actually trying to remember uh, Parfait, whether uh, the last time we met was in, uh, in Kenya, uh, when they, they were um, working on the uh, uh, South Sudan peace process there in 2019, or whether it was when you came to Juba for the Sudan peace talks. And as I was trying to figure this out, I realized that it's actually an illustration of how interconnected um, these conflicts uh, are in, in the Horn uh, and, and, and all of these political issues are in the Horn uh, that, that uh, there, is, there is so much, uh, there's so much back and forth. Uh, but but as, as David said, just hugely uh, appreciative um, of the fact that you can make uh, time for us, uh, which even by the Horn's normal standards uh, is, is an incredibly busy uh, and hectic um, period. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, most of our, our participants today uh, will know uh, that the Horn of Africa is a major uh, priority uh, for the Irish government, has been for, for many years. Uh, I would venture uh, po possibly rarely, if ever, uh, as much of a focus um, as it is uh, today. Um, I think it is well known we will take up our seat uh, on the UN uh, Security Council in, in January, on the 1st of January at, at 12 midnight, um, and we are, we're currently uh, getting ready for this. Um, but maybe what may be le less well known um, is that of all the uh, UN Security Council files, um, about 70% are Africa. And within that uh, proportion, about 65%, I think, is the Horn of Africa. So really, the Horn of Africa is, is, is going to be, I suppose, such a huge part of, of Ireland's uh, um, tenure on the Security Council. And, and we're, we're working day in, day out, uh, my colleagues and I, on obviously on Ethiopia, uh, and particularly also on some of the UN Security Council um, items on Sudan, uh, South Sudan, uh, and uh, Somalia. Um, so I, I might just briefly touch on, on what some of our, our priorities are. Um, you know, I think Ethiopia, one, one has to start with Ethiopia uh, at the moment. Um, it, this is actually Ireland's largest uh, bilateral uh, development uh, cooperation program. Uh, we've been working there for many years. 
the situation in Ethiopia is uh, enormously uh, worrying. Um, the possible implications on the country itself and the region, I think, are, are almost uh, unimaginable, uh, uh, frankly. Um, and there is much we don't know because of the current communications uh, blackout. Um, but I think what we do know is is pretty devastating, and and you know the the, the notion of a a uh, an, an offensive, a major offensive on the the regional capital, uh, Mekele, is 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 obviously of, of huge uh, concern. We know over forty thousand refugees have already fled uh, to Sudan, um, and we're very worried to hear, um, you know, and and, and Minister Kovni has made. Uh, a few statements uh, about Ethiopia, including about uh, the ethnic profiling uh, dimension, which is which is really worrying um, in in Addis Ababa, among other other places. And um, so, through through advocacy, through the minister and his engagements at, at European uh, and international level, uh, through our embassy in, in Addis, uh, you know, and and you know, we, we are we are doing our best uh, to advocate on the situation, and we're also providing. Uh, humanitarian funding to, uh, you know, to the affected regions within Ethiopia, but also to the refugees in, in East um, Sudan. Um, and it will probably be, you know, quite a long time before we can kind of step back and, and take stock of, of what's in the middle of happening uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Parfait, it, 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 it certainly relates, uh, the genesis of the crisis that we're seeing certainly relates to the theme of your talk today on, on policy, uh, politics and, and governance um, in the Horn. Um, and at least in part, uh, I suppose what we're looking at is a conflict uh, around the Federalist model, uh, how this relates to ethnicity and, and, and these, these kinds of issues. Um, this then brings me on to Somalia, where we're also seeing uh, tensions uh, around federalism and, and where that model uh, is under pressure uh, in the lead up to, to the elections there and tensions between the federal government uh, and the member states, uh, of course, compounded by uh, the threat of, of al-Shabaab. Um, Ireland is in uh, discussions at the moment about taking the role of the chair of the Somalia Sanctions Committee uh, for our term on the Security Council. Uh, and we hope to play a role in, in helping this uh, troubled country uh, move away uh, from conflict. Um, another troubled country and, and one that is uh, very close to, to, to my heart uh, is South Sudan, uh, where I spent uh, most of this year of, of COVID and, and uh, as David said, just finished off my, my second stint in, in South Sudan. Um, um, and, and I think, you know, another country which is struggling with, uh, with governance, uh, power sharing, of course, after the 2018 peace agreement being the, the order of the day at the moment, and, and certainly a role also played by, by ethnicity, although I would have certainly observed uh, a lot of uh, politicization of ethnicity and so sometimes I wonder, you know, how, how much of the ethnic dynamics that we see are actually stoked by by politicians. Um, and then finally, uh, as far as, as, as the, our Security Council agenda is concerned on the Horn uh, is of course Sudan. And, and of course there, there are some um, you know, real positives here and Ireland is, is very keenly supporting the, uh, the transition. Uh, it's fragile, uh, but at the same time, I think it's important to recognize and learn from the positives uh, of what's happening in, 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 in Sudan to date. Uh, and I remember very well uh, being in, in Khartoum uh, for a meeting uh, just before the protest started in December of 2019. And had anyone said to me, you know, in six months time, Bashir will be gone, I, I literally would have laughed in their faces. I mean, I had no, no conception uh, that this was, was possible after, after 30, 30 years. Uh, so, so change is possible, uh, change is possible in the horn. Uh, people power uh, has has really proved to be to be powerful, um, and Ireland would certainly like to support that kind of uh, peaceful and, and, and democratic change elsewhere in the Horn, uh, where, where opportunities uh, present. Um, so, uh, Parfait, Special Envoy, you have such a wide and deep uh, experience uh, at the UN and in Africa. So, I really couldn't think of a better person to come in and advise us at this time as we as we take our Security Council seat. Uh, and, and that allows us, obviously, as Ireland, to, to tackle these horn issues from, from a different um, vantage point. So, so really, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And a, a big thanks to IEA for, for putting all this together.
Thank you very much, uh, Sinead. And with that, Parfait, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sinead, um, for this uh, brilliant introduction. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, the difference between uh, um, you and I is that you'll be sitting uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the Security Council and, and dealing with all of these uh, on, on a daily basis. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, rather happy that uh, the topic of the day uh, will allow me to uh, discuss more broadly issues, not really dwell into specifics. Uh, and having said this, I would like to thank uh, um, the um, Inst Institute of International and European Affairs uh, for your kind invitation to speak at this prestigious uh, institute. Uh, your warm welcome and, and generous introduction, um, you know, give me um, lots of, uh, of course, um, a, a, a pleasure um, and uh, to be with you today. And I hope to contribute to your institution's well-established tradition of uh, advancing the global discourse, policy discourse on the key challenges affecting uh, our world and ultimately the lives of people uh, 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 around the planet. Incidentally, um, today's event coincides with the commemoration of the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Um, sadly, a silent pandemic of uh, violence against women and girls is causing an acceptable pain uh, under the shadow of uh, the global uh, coronavirus pandemic. And it is appalling uh, to know that such a violence uh, takes place primarily in the family. Let's uh, uh, pay tribute to the millions of brave uh, women and girls and men who are breaking the silence to fight this awful scourge. Um, being virtually with you in Ireland uh, reminds me of one of uh, the torch bearers of this fight uh, against violence, um, on, on violence against women, uh, whom I had, uh, um, such as the former president of, um, of Ireland, President Mary Robinson, uh, whom I had the rare opportunity to work with and learn from in our common passion for um, world peace, particularly in Africa. As the first UN Special Envoy for the Great Lakes region of Africa, um, uh, she dedicated a, a lot of, uh, of her work and energy. And I will never forget uh, President Robinson's unwavering commitment to consolidate peace and stability in that conflict-ridden region with uh, a special emphasis on the role of women in peace and security. In one of her many visits uh, to the countries of the region, I had the privilege of accompanying her to Kirundo um, in the Northern part of Burundi, where she was due to meet with the late uh, President Kurunziza. We reached that remote city located in a luxuriant hilly bush um, after riding a noisy helicopter for 45 minutes. The president was upbeat and determined to rally strong political support for the implementation of the peace agreement, um, the peace, security, and cooperation framework agreement for the DRC and the region, a document she rightfully labeled the last chance agreement. Um, I was deeply impressed by her stamina and inspired uh, by her clear vision of the prospects for lasting regional peace and stability. Uh, on our way back to the capital city of Bujumbura, I couldn't resist um, but to ask her what the source of her faith uh, in the cause of peace was. After a little pause, she replied in her thoughtful and elegant voice, by modestly quoting another iconic personality, her friend, Reverend uh, Desmond Tutu of South Africa, who once said that he considered himself 
a prisoner of hope. Uh, I have since kept these few words uh, as a man, especially during challenging times, as the ones we are currently facing. I hope that our discussion today will be both meaningful and fitting uh, to the extraordinary circumstances the Horn of Africa region and more broadly our world is going through. I am grateful for your interest in the fate of the people of the Horn of Africa, a region that is home to approximately 280 million people if you count the Horn as uh, encompassing all EGAN member states, um, and a vast majority of whom are young, a region that is going through profound and multifaceted uh, transition uh, processes. And uh, uh, Sinead, you just referred to some of these uh, issues that will be before you in the Council. Uh, they are all in search of greater stability, economic prosperity, and regional integration. A region that is struggling to free itself from the, the shackles of decades of conflict, extreme poverty, and dictatorial rule. Before I begin addressing the current political situation in the whole of Africa against the backdrop of the novel coronavirus a global pandemic, also known as COVID-19, I would like to begin by asking you a question. How many of you have heard of the name Loal Mayen? And this is, it brings you back home, uh, Sinead, in, in South Sudan. Loal was born in Wharton, South Sudan, and lost members of his family while making the perilous trek from South Sudan to a refugee camp in northern Uganda. Today, this resilient young man is a successful video game developer right, residing in the United States leading his own company and using the experiences from his past to inform his products. Games aim at peace building and conflict resolution. His inspirational story should keep us all hopeful that a different world is always possible. And that when given the opportunity, African youth and young people in general can do wonders. Uh, Loal's story is especially important during difficult times when it feels as though uh, everything is falling apart uh, during times like these ones. Um, Chairperson, uh, distinguished guest, our world is facing daunting challenges and harrowing disparities that continue to plague humanity. COVID-19 has further exposed discrepancies and magnified inequalities worldwide. And is often, it is often sadly the case, uh, those at the bottom continue to bear the brand while COVID does not discriminate against the have and have not, nor borders, nationalities, ethnicities, or religious beliefs. It is a fact that those more fortunate have been able to shield themselves better. Prior to COVID-19, our world was already exposed to multiple threats and crises. If we take poverty alone, daily scores of human beings are silently being killed by hunger around the world. However, this uncomfortable reality is often ignored in headlines. We know that things could be better, things could be different. And if anything, COVID-19 has taught us that we can no longer hide behind our false securities. Indeed, most crises the world faces today don't respect borders. We do have a choice. We can choose to draw lessons from this pandemic and reverse course, or choose to keep burying our heads in fictional comfort zones and face consequences of catastrophic proportions for us all, sooner or later. In the Horn of Africa, against the most pessimistic projections and to our surprise and relief, the world's health impacts seems to have been mitigated, at least for now. COVID-19 remains a slow moving threat that requires continuous vigilance and engagement in a region already battling numerous threats and structural de 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 deficiencies. In the interim, it appears that the proactive prevention measures applied region-wide region 
have succeeded in protecting people from COVID-19's most immediate devastating health consequences and fears of or out havoc. Given the region's weak health systems, uh, this is indeed good news. However, while numbers are relatively low, the picture may be blurred due to the lack of re reliable data. This pandemic is compounding pre-existing challenges and will have serious and long-term social economic implications, making it ever harder for countries in the region to achieve pre-pandemic objectives and the sustainable development goals, a, a theme um, on, on which uh, the chair, David, you've been working uh, very substantively. Uh, as we speak, a new wave of desert locust invasion, the worst indicates is ruining months of hard work and endangering the lives of millions of people across the Horn of Africa. While we all agree that development is first and foremost a responsibility of each government, the fact is all nations are not equally equipped to address and meet the basic needs of their populations. There are, of course, historical reasons for this. Most of the countries in the Horn of Africa region are relatively new nations with a weak or non-existing social contract. Even in older nations, state formation is still underway and efforts to construct a common narrative remain precarious given the very fragmented and predominantly uh, identity-based nature of their uh, polity. And uh, uh, Sinead, you, you, you refer to that. Those of you who have been um, following political developments in the Horn know that COVID-19 has had a direct bearing on a few electoral processes, including in Ethiopia. Decisions on postponing or proceeding with elections have raised complicated political, legal, human rights, and public health challenges in several countries. The consequences have not been the same in all the countries and a major difference is in their ability or lack of it to find a common ground, ideally through consensus building as uh, they navigate this difficult uh, transition context. However, not many countries in the region have a long established democratic culture. Conversely, many countries have a strong authoritarian past and are accustomed to a model of government that is based on or has legitimized identity politics, including, of course, ethnicity. It will therefore not be easy for most countries to leapfrog um, um, and, uh, and, and, and transition uh, um, to, uh, you know, to transform deep-rooted mindsets in, in um, exclusive politics. So overcoming these challenges uh, and these fragilities uh, will require both visionary leadership and political will, as well as grassroots, continuous grassroots engagement. Uh, in polarized societies, um, as you are very familiar uh, with, where identity, identities are politicized, COVID-19 has reinforced tendencies to further shrink political space and derail democratic processes. Identity politics bluntly appeal to emotions rather than to any organizing principle or shared transformative narrative that could help fragmented societies build inclusivity and achieve greater unity and social cohesion. And this is not specific to Africa. People often respond to identity politics because they feel recognized and suffer within their groupings, particularly in the absence of real alternatives due to failed state level governance. I share the Mo Ibrahim Foundation's definition of governance, which should be, quote, more than transparency and democracy, the ability of states to properly deliver to its citizens all the political, social, economic, and environmental public goods and services that any 21st century citizen has the right to expect, unquote. 
two important dimensions are implied in the above definition. Firstly, that successful governance performance cannot be delivered in a vacuum, but is reflective of the political, financial, economic, and environmental you know, constraints uh, inherent to our globalized world. And secondly, that governance processes should not be identity-based and policies should be built on just and fair distribution of services, regardless of identity or political allegiance. I know this is easy said and done, and we often tend to downplay the many pressure points affecting political decisions in countries in transition. Let's not, for example, forget that war was part of a ruthless history in Europe and that it took centuries to forge more coherent and rule-based societies. This, of course, um, should be no excuse for any state in the Horn of Africa or continent-wide for not building more peaceful and inclusive nations. Chairperson, um, while there have been uh, commendable overall governance gains in Africa in recent years, mainly due to improvements of economic opportunities and human development, the 2020 Ibrahim uh, Index um, of African governance notes that these gains are threatened by, quote, an increasingly precarious security situation and concerning erosion in rights as well as civic and democratic space, unquote. Though the path to nation building is not easy, the trajectory is slowly changing. And we are seeing communities across the continent, increasingly demanding for results, effective governance and accountability. We saw this last year in the historical revolution in Sudan, um, uh, you, you just referred to, which was led by outstanding young people and especially courageous and exemplary women aspiring to bring about a better future for themselves and their country. While applauding these uh, bold steps, the path to stable political transformation and more democratic societies will remain pretty rocky. Admittedly, much more will be needed to fulfill the stated commitment of African state to silencing the guns and build a future that materializes the vision of a peaceful and prosperous Africa contained in the AU's Agenda 2063. Though there is no one fits one size fits all, and there are different national narratives and processes underway, it is undeniable that in today's Africa, people and especially civil society organizations are galvanized. Most people in the region are strongly convinced that they deserve better and are addressing the legitimate aspirations for more decent lives and a better future. Several governments are also seizing this momentous development. These admirable efforts will, however, remain constrained if they are not met at the international level with a real commitment to addressing global challenges and imbalances uh, through a more effective multilateralism. Chair, I'm asking if, um, as we look at things together, isn't it unsettling that 20 years in this 21st century, we are still globally reproducing the partners of the 16th century triangular trade system, which dedicated specific roles to regions, to different regions. As the value chain is determined in industrial nations, developing countries were and still are seen as a source of uh, raw materials processed in industrial nations, leaving behind a heavy carbon footprint. Consumable goods are dedicated to select nations and low-end products are sent back to these developing nations, which are not equipped to recycle. I know this may be um, oversimplified, but the end result of this antiquated and destructive cycle is that countries, including those in the whole of Africa, which are the least responsible for global warming are adversely the most impacted by and least equipped to deal with climate change and related environment degradation. Growing water scarcity and desertification are aggravating food insecurity. 
On the other hand, changing migration partners are exacerbating existing transboundary conflicts and jeopardizing stability in the region. I have come to you today, Chair, uh, not as an expert, but as someone who has had the privilege of traveling around our beautiful planet. I have grown deeply convinced of the complexity and interconnectedness of things and realities we may at first glance think as far apart. This has led me to think about the problems we face, not in silos, but rather in holistic terms. How then can we pretend to understand the Horn of Africa, the topic of our discussion today, without looking at the regions and more broadly, the continent historical, political and economic relationship with the rest of the world, particularly with Europe? The global coronavirus pandemic we are still grappling with has exposed bare the source of our deeply troubled world. Inequalities within and between countries have reached unsustainable levels. We knew before COVID-19 that things weren't going well. We knew that millions around the world were going to bed hungry every night in total indifference. We knew that millions of children didn't have access to school and that every day the digital divide was widening, leaving millions more in total darkness. Yet we have largely remained deaf to the plight of many more millions wandering in the wildness or drawn in the womb of roaring seas in the desperate quest for a decent life. Instead, walls of all sorts are being erected. But once the cup overflows, I'm afraid, walls of privilege may be smashed by feats of despair. Over the past few months, we have been reminded of the fragility of our four securities. Many of us have grown worried and unsettled by the outbursts of our cozy bubbles. Yet there is little evidence that we will put our best energies, knowledge, technological advances, and financial assets to invest in more inclusive societies rather than stubbornly attempting, attempting to fill in the gaps of our decaying vessel. Hesitations to fully embrace UN Secretary, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres call to ensure that any COVID-19 vaccine is made available to people around the world as a global common good is in this regard quite revealing. Uh, Chair, let me repeat it. Governance in the Horn of Africa cannot be fully understood and fixed without addressing the systemic imbalances and biases of our world. The prevailing global international system is unsustainable. Its nefarious, its nefarious effects are detrimental to most countries, people, and the planet. We know today that economic growth at all costs as the key indicator of progress puts profit before people and business before the planet. While acknowledging the commendable steps being implemented to reverse course and limit global warming to pre-industrial levels, including through the modest yet commendable Paris Agreement, the fact is we are lagging and dangerously close to missing the target as we are from the brink. We are not prepared to what is to come and there will be no new Noah's Ark and no planet B either. In the whole of Africa and more broadly in developing countries, the byproduct of economic growth race, of the economic growth race has meant resorting to borrowing massive amounts of money leading to unbearable levels of public and private debt. This has also meant more dependency are credit, as creditors and multinational corporations have taken advantage of these circumstances to acquire natural resources at cheap costs and other concessions, including through corrupt practices. As the global community finds itself in a protracted economic recession and countries in the Horn are struggling to cope with the multifaceted consequences and long-term uh, detrimental effect of uh, COVID-19, 
we should ask ourselves if we want to continue protecting a fundamentally unbalanced system that entrenches inequalities within and between countries and continents and endangers our very planet. Beyond acknowledging that climate change poses an existential challenge to humanity, why are we still investing so much capital in salvaging a system that is so harmful? Those are some of the questions that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself. Encouraging measures and innovative propositions towards what is called a third industrial revolution are being developed. Their proponents um, rightly call for di divesting in the foss fossil fuels and investing in renewable energy and business models that will help achieve a zero carbon future. We applaud this indispensable energy transition and its pace must be accelerated. Yet, let's ensure the new promised land does not repeat past mistakes, placing the economy and profit before people and justice. Similarly, we should remain concerned that in the fast evolving digital economy, fueled by massive, massive personal data, the majority of people get excluded from the very lucrative gains. Here, you may recall uh, the thought provoking statement delivered in this very forum on June 10th by uh, the President of Ireland. His Excellency um, uh, Michael um, Higgins on the theme Europe and Africa towards a new relationship. I could have simply quoted his entire address today to acknowledge its boldness and reaffirmation of African agency, uh, the notion of African agency so brilliantly articulated by my brother and friend, Professor Carlos Lopez. Among the many refreshing points made by President Higgins, one particularly struck my attention when he argues that, and I quote, an overall commitment to good governance and state well-being is needed in many African states as a pre prerequisite, but this cannot be used as an excuse for sh shirking Europe's moral and ethical obligation to progressing and being partners in Africa's overdue economic and wider social transformation, unquote. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the government of Ireland for its outstanding campaign and successful election as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Ireland's success can be attributed to its clear rejection of the imbalances that are governing our world today. Many African countries saw in the Irish government's message a strong call for a fairer world. This must also be true in the global political governance architecture. The 75-year-old multilateral order in Haiti for World War II maintains certain countries as second-class na nations, and notably no African country is today a permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, though, uh, and uh, Sinead, you again said it, matters pertaining to Africa dominate the Security Council's agenda. This, we all agree, must change. From January 2021, 20, uh, one country of the Horn of Africa, Kenya, will join two other African countries to serve for two years alongside Ireland as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Yet, at least three countries of the Horn of Africa will feature on the agenda of the Security Council, probably the highest number for any regional group, in any other regional group. Um, our world continues to suffer from an anachronic colonial legacy and tenacious patronizing mindset that permeates almost all aspects of our contemporary world. This also must change. Last week, encouragingly, at the G20 summit in Riyadh, leaders of the, world's, of the world's 20 biggest economies said they were determined to support African countries in overcoming the coronavirus crisis, including by exploring more sustainable financing options. As Secretary General Guterres remarked at the summit, 
our greatest defense against COVID-19, he said, is solidarity and cooperation. I echo his closing uh, remarks in Riyadh, quote, we can only get there together, committed to an inclusive multilateralism based on international law and the values of the UN Charter, unquote. Chairperson, uh, the countries of the whole of Africa have already traveled many decades um, and achieved substantial progress given their tormented state formation history and enduring social, uh, sociological burdens. In fact, we must be appreciative of the remarkable strides they have made against all odds in a relative, uh, relatively short lifespan. Yet, the way home is still a long one. And it is paved with daunting and deeply rooted, but not insuperable challenges. They will better succeed by joining hands and strengthening regional cooperation and partnerships, including by optimizing the promises of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Living in peace and stability in diverse societies is possible. If a deliberate and intelligent choice for respect for the rule of law, and consensus building is made, not once, but all the time, in times of peace, and even more so during crisis. And through that process, through that process, lay the ground for institutions that promote justice and fairness, not as a reflection of the prevailing balance of power, because this can change over time, but as an expression of the inherent equality of all their citizens, regardless of status, power, or population size. This should serve as the foundation of an inclusive social contract and be re reflected in constitutional and legal systems. But as desirable and indispensable as they may be, strong institutions with built-in check and balance mechanisms cannot be transformative on their own. They require both principal political leaders, particularly in relatively new democratic system, as well as vigilant and engaged civil society organizations and citizens. And this in turn implies the enjoyment of all political freedoms and rights. In fact, the, credi the credibility of any such compact should be judged against its ability to protect the weakest groups in any society. Admittedly, very few nations have passed that test considering the largely devastating impact of COVID-19 on poorer groups the world over. Chairperson, we have passed the ticking clock scenario. The alarm bell has rung and abruptly woken us up. Uh, we must stop playing lip service and take the bull by the horns. The youth everywhere is rightly impatient and is telling us that the prevailing system is no longer acceptable. We need to listen to young people like valiant um, uh, Greta from Sweden and take collective action. Closer to us, um, my dear friend and, and, and young sister, Haya Shebi, the AU's youth special envoy, has also been beating the drum of change and we must act now. Multilateralism, which has suffered a great deal, must be revitalized. Corporations, which enjoy tax havens and astronomic profits from a financial system that is detached from a shocked global economy, need to be scrutinized and required to play their part. Our world should not be driven by economic gains only, but a higher sense of solidarity and shared responsibility. Aiming for profit alone leads to mayhem and in the long term is self-defeating. Chairperson, I'm talking about fairness, not charity. I am talking about a global economic system that pays a fair price to farmers in developing countries, allows communities and societies to create wealth and break the degrading cycle of extreme poverty while protecting the environment, including through climate justice and adequate uh, mitigation and adaptation support programs. 
this is consequential to achieving the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, including its uh, goal 16, uh, to promote justice and strong institutions with a view to advancing more peaceful and inclusive societies in the Horn of Africa. It is achievable, but not without effective solidarity, underpinned by a shared vision and faith in humanity's common destiny. Faith in a world where women and girls can freely prosper to their fullest potential. Uh, chairperson, the challenges of our time require a new state of consciousness that is still sorely lacking. Even as the promise of effective vaccines uh, against COVID-19 represent an immense relief, provided they are made available to all. Moving forward, let's hope that the realization of the existential uh, challenges we collectively face will force us to act purposefully and swiftly. The poignant appeal of Pope Francis in his most recent encyclical, uh, Fratelli uh, Tutti, provide us a glimpse of the immense possibilities from which short-term gains still prevent us from fully embracing the rich promises. We must display solidarity and in the words of late of the late Martin Luther King Jr. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Uh, yes, things may be falling apart, but I'm sure chair, hope will endure. And uh, I thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Parfait. That was a very powerful presentation and you covered many, many important themes. Um, uh, I think you raised profound and troubling questions about, um, about the, the difficult path that countries in the Horn of Africa have to follow in order to build peace and to create uh, a sustainable economic order and one which is equitable and which respects basic rights. You covered a, a multitude of themes and thank you very, very much for that. We uh, can I also say in passing that uh, we very much agree with one point you made in uh, about the need for greater African representation on the Security Council. It's one that Ireland has been quite strong on. But um, we have a, a, a short uh, number of minutes left in which we can take some questions from the audience if you were good enough to answer them, Parfait. Um, I mean, there are quite a, a lot which have come in. Uh, one uh, which I will begin with uh, relates to um, the limited success of the ICC in pursuing accountability in Africa and, and the impact that this has obviously on the search for peace and reconciliation. How do you view the prospects for international efforts at achieving accountability in, in the region? Um, could I add in also another question just for myself on how you see the role of the UN in potentially helping to bring about a cessation of hostilities in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Tigray at the, at the moment. Over to you, Pave. Thank you very much. I, I try to be brief and, and, and say that the concern for uh, international justice and accountability are indeed um, a major, um, uh, are, are critically important for, I think, for the communities for the African uh, people themselves. And, and, and uh, we can see it, uh, people more and more are demanding for, for this, this accountability. And, and as, as regards the, the, the ICC, uh, we must uh, uh, be fair to say that uh, most of the cases in the ICC are African cases and most of them were indeed uh, at the request of African state themselves. So it may not be totally accurate to suggest that uh, ICC has failed in, in, in Africa. On the contrary, there was a, a, a greater concern in the sense that uh, the institution was maybe a bit unbalanced and that uh, there was a, a, a too much focus on, on, on Africa alone. Uh, but but uh, at the end of the day, uh, I, I do believe that uh, uh, these are uh, issues that uh, are extremely uh, vital. They, 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 uh, they will define, of course, the, the, the future of, uh, of uh, uh, stability and prosperity in Africa. And, and African countries, I think, are taking this very seriously. 
and I, I do hope that uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, trend, even though I just stated that uh, there was a risk to see um, a, a kind of uh, 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 governance and rule of law scaling back, uh, retreating. Uh, but in the end, I'm absolutely confident that uh, uh, the, the demands we are seeing will ensure that just justice indeed uh, will remain a, a major uh, uh, good, common good for the people of, of, of the continent. Um, and uh, the, the, the UN remains absolutely uh, engaged. Um, um, and uh, I, as we speak, uh, the most important concern is indeed uh, to providing um, as, 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 as much as possible um, uh, humanitarian support to all those who, who may be uh, um, uh, affected by this, uh, by the ongoing um, uh, 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 conflict. Um, and we, we, we are doing this, um, uh, the whole country team um, in, um, in, in the country is working uh, very closely with the national authorities, with the government, and um, we can simply say that uh, uh, this is a commitment which uh, will continue to occupy all of us. You have seen the, the many calls of the Secretary General to ensure that uh, 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 there is uh, uh, an impeded humanitarian uh, access and, and, uh, and protection is provided to both uh, uh, um, the, the, the civilian affected, but also humanitarian workers. Um, who are uh, uh, sacrificing so much to provide, uh, to, to meet the needs of those people um, in, 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 uh, in, in, in danger. So we will continue to do this. Um, we are not doing it only here, uh, but um, some of those who have already fled the country on the other side we uh, have found themselves in, in, in Sudan are also, of course, uh, provided with, the, with as much assistance as possible. And as, again, as I said, uh, we, have, uh, we are partnering with the government in uh, 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 providing these uh, this important and vital services to the people. Thank you very much, Pate. Um, turning specifically to Somalia as one of the countries uh, for which you have responsibility, uh, one uh, member of our audience who has lived there raises the deeply rooted nature of corruption in, in Somalia. Uh, Somalia was first in, in Transparency International's Corruption Index for 12 consecutive years. How do you think we can address uh, such in, entrenched issues of corruption? Well, um, um, I, I, I mean, co corruption is, is not something that uh, um, the UN condones. And um, I, I, I very frankly don't think that there is uh, any responsible authority in any country who should be uh, condoning corruption. Um, co 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 corruption has a cost. It costs lives. Um, it it uh, diverts uh, very scarce resources um, from the um, you know, um, main uh, use that is to uh, meet the needs of, uh, of people uh, who are really struggling. Um, 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 corruption um, uh, diverts uh, vital, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, medical education, uh, very scarce resources that really are ne in need um, in, in countries like, uh, like, like, like like Somalia. And therefore, it's definitely not something that uh, uh, should be, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, condoned. And 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 we, we we have, of course, in a country like like like, like Somalia, the priority remains, of course. In addressing insecurity and stability, and uh, my colleagues who are on the ground are, uh, you know, working uh, uh, day in day out with the entire uh, international community present in a, in a, in, in in Somalia with the government uh, to ensure that these uh, 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 um, challenges can be overcome. But this is not going to happen overnight. I I I, I realize that uh, uh, we have so much parallel criminality that is ongoing. Uh, simply addressing the, the threats that Al Shabaab poses and its own criminal organization is all encompassing challenges that, of course, can only be uh, fully um, uh, addressed if uh, we achieve, if Somalia achieve a state of stability and security that will reestablish the rule of law 
and uh, make it possible to to uh, uh, build, you know, re re reliable and accountable institutions. So it's a long way uh, to to get there, and we can already be all uh, uh, pleased that uh, steps towards organizing the next uh, uh, elections are underway, and uh, and hopefully this would be uh, also uh, an important uh, building block into uh, precisely achieving a step a more stable and and uh, and secure uh, 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 country many thanks Buffy. um you spoke very eloquently about uh, the uh, sustainable development goals and the the fundamental developmental needs uh, in in the region obviously the pandemic has slowed things down in the short term there are immediate concerns around food security and extreme poverty which COVID-19 has exacerbated, but are there, one member of our audience asks whether there are concrete steps which you think could be taken to, to promote and serve the, the, uh, the um, SDGs uh, implementation in the context of recovery from the pandemic. Absolutely. I mean, look, we, we, we said it, uh, even in the pre-COVID um, uh, 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 you know, phase, uh, the Secretary General was already, you know, uh, pulling the alarm bell and 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 uh, uh, telling, you know, and the, and the Deputy Secretary General, they, were, they both were already at telling the world that uh, beware, we may be going off track and we may not be able to achieve the, the, the SDGs. And uh, so this this was before the pandemic. And today we know that uh, the whole world will be entering into, you know, a, a recession. So we we applaud the, the recent decisions of the G G20 to ensure that uh, they, they can pull together and provide the resources that would make it possible for for us all to be better and stronger in the post uh, uh, COVID-19 era. And we, it's very encouraging to see uh, that, uh, 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 for example, for the service of the debt, for the debt service, you know. There was a decision to postpone, you know, uh, the to, to extend the, the period of, of uh, uh, freezing the the, uh, the the paying the service of the debt, uh, the debt service, which of course is not uh, um, the 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 best outcome. Uh, let's 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 be uh, uh, blunt about it, uh, as uh, uh, we do believe that more should be done, including you know into uh, 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 totally cancelling. Uh, this this debt, and uh, you know, if we look uh, at the, the the condition in which uh, those countries got in, in so much, uh, you know, uh, burden. Uh, so, uh, but this already in itself is something. Uh, those resources would have to be uh, repurposed, uh, not to pay the service. I mean, it's absolutely appalling to see that uh, some countries are paid, putting more money, more more of their very limited resources into paying, you know. Uh, the the uh, repaying the debt than than in uh, you know uh, investing in schools in, in health services and 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 uh, creating decent jobs so we believe that it cannot be done these countries will not be able to do it on their own and this is where we say that um, one thing is indeed to address the, the core issue i mean the, the whole issue of uh, of debt relief but also moving forward i mean we have to put in place uh, 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 you know, global trade that is fairer, as, as I said, you know, we need to ensure that we are not asking for charity, but that, you know, farmers are, are given their, their fair share, uh, that uh, 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 natural resources are, are, are not, you know, uh, uh, you know, get uh, um, uh, acquired for, for, for nearly nothing uh, or, or in-kind repayment for, for any, any, any debt. Things of this kind have to be have to be addressed, and and more broadly, more broadly, we have to put an end to the kind of uh, carbon-intensive economy model that we have at, at the moment. This kind of uh, global trade, I mean, it serves ninety percent of uh, global warming and and uh, carbon dioxide comes from this uh, intensive trade, uh, uh, maritime trade. So we should do something to put an end to this. Investment must take place where the goods, natural raw material exist. And this can be done, you know, uh, by uh, um, ensuring that uh, uh, um, uh, by ensuring that uh, uh, um, investments are protected. We can all work together with those countries to ensure that uh, legal systems are put in place to protect investment that may be coming from, from outside, 
But if this is done, jobs will be created, will be, will be uh, absolutely limiting the carbon footprint uh, um, um, involved in this intensive trade and, and will be creating new jobs for, the, for, 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 uh, for you know, the, the youngsters in these countries, keep them at home and ensure that you know, they can think, they can um, um, hope for a better future. What is happening today is simply unsustainable. Parfait, we thank you very much for that. We've unfortunately come to the end of the of the time for for this event, but I have to say you ended on on a very important note, which you which you struck many times, several times during your presentation, namely the importance of youth for implementing the SDGs, but for also achieving many of the goals uh, of uh, peace, justice, and equity in in the Horn of Africa. Um, thank you very much for giving, taking time to speak to the Institute and to its, it, its audience today. Uh, we were delighted to have you, Parfait. Uh, we wish you every success in your uh, ongoing work, particularly with current challenges. I'm sorry that we haven't had more time to reach That's more awesome. questions. There were many of them. But thank you to everybody who, who listened today. And uh, most of all, thank you, Parfait. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.